Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to this important event to talk about hate speech. <clears throat> hate speech and online hate are the topics of my current research, but I have also personal experience of uh, being a target of hate speech online. I have been called, just to name a few, uh, a green leftist ideologist, a stupid idiot, a feminazi, an incompetent researcher, and perhaps my favorite at this time, a gypsy-looking feminist rat. So uh, the, the aim of these frequent attacks uh, against me is, of course, to silence me and prevent me from studying and talking about hate speech. But at least so far, uh, the attempts have failed because here I am again, once again, talking about the dangers of hate speech and how it threatens the key values of Finnish democracy. Equality, the possibility to participate in public discussion and politics regardless of one's background and freedom of speech. I'm not sure if, okay, yeah. I always have these uh, problems with this, so how, how do I move on? Thank you. Okay. So, um, in democratic societies, a broad variety of groups has representation in decision making and political discussion. Freedom of speech is a core value. In a functioning democracy, freedom of speech applies to everyone, everyone, and the participation of different groups in political activity activities is even desirable. Freedom of speech is uh, defined by World Population Review, and I quote, the right for an individual or community to express any opinions without censorship or restraint and without fear of retaliation or legal sanction. Freedom of speech is not limited to verbal communication. Uh, rather, it also includes uh, other forms of expression, such as written communication, social media posts, the arts, personal actions, political protests, and so on. Freedom of right is a right preserved in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and formally granted by the laws of most nations. But, at, as is suggested in the World Population Review, free speech can also be taken too far. An ongoing debate, and I'm citing, uh, exists about where to draw the line between free expression and offensive, threatening, or harmful content. Particularly in the age of social media, when freedom of speech can be viewed as permission to spread damaging misinformation, bully others, and promote hate and intolerance, concerns have aris arisen over whether free speech can sometimes cause more harm than good." End of quote. Be it as it may, uh, Finland is the, in the top three countries of the world uh, with the most freedom of speech and has a high rank of, uh, in the Freedom of, of Press Index as well. <clears throat> So Finns, we Finns value reading, and as we heard, literacy is high. Uh, besides reading fiction, half of Finns recognize the importance of reading uh, about public discussions and debates about politics. The statistics of Finnish reading habits are, however, controversial. The number of books read has decreased, and the number of young with poor reading skills is growing, unfortunately. Besides literacy, there is a high level of trust in scientific research and universities as institutions, as well as, as well as news media. Trust in the media 
has been maintained with preserving a strong regional press and uh, having our public broadcaster, ULE. Uh, also, Finnish education system is of high quality and it reaches everyone, although the PISA results are, have been falling lately. High level of literacy and media literacy uh, and trust in education and science explain uh, in its part uh, our success in fighting misinformation. As you all know, disinformation uh, is defined as the deliberately disseminated, distorted, false or misleading information, whereas misinformation refers to unintentionally spreading false information. These both are common in the contemporary digitalized culture. We are living in uh, an era of post-truth, as it's called, uh, with, which means an increasing number of false news and so-called alternative facts. Behind these developments, there are uh, firstly the technological change or revolution, and I'm referring to internet and social media, of course, and second, a trend of political polarization, particularly the rise of uh, radical right populism. A CNN report uh, by Elisa McIntosh, uh, Finland is winning the war on fake news, as, it, as it's titled, uh, introduces uh, certain courses as a part of an anti-fake news initiative that was launched by uh, Finland's government um, and it was aimed at teaching residents, students, journalists and politicians uh, on how to counter false information and designed to sow division that was, yeah, tried try to make, that, that people right, tried to make. And by the launch of this campaign 2014, uh, it was said that information warfare was moving online. And this is where the battle for information is, of course, uh, more and more so. <clears throat> After setting this um, background, I'm, uh, let's finally go deeper uh, in the actual topic of my talk, and that is hate speech. Hate speech is a discursive and contextual phenomenon. It is defined differently in different times and contexts and societies, and uh, it also depends on who is defining it, also maybe on who is uh, experiencing it. It is unfortunately a growing phenomenon, and it is a societal problem as well as a legal issue. It has been outlined in international treaties, declarations, and legislation, and also in national legislations. Approaches to hate speech vary for example, in the United States, there, there is this strong emphasis on uh, free speech, sort of a holy thing, uh, a constitutional right that cannot be touched in any way, versus the European understanding of hate speech uh, as harmful and, and something that violates uh, other rights, such as the right to express one's opinions and the right to protection for marginalized groups. But despite these differences, uh, there is a commonly shared understanding that hate speech is harmful because it threatens equality, personal dignity and security. It endangers the rights of various minorities. It endangers freedom of speech, democracy and rule of law. But it is true that, that we need to sort of uh, really carefully uh, kind of uh, compare and weigh against, uh, I mean, com Weigh, weigh these uh, violations of various rights uh, against protection of freedom of speech. So it is really challenging to define hate speech. Uh, it may take various forms and manifestations, and it varies from insulting and disturbing uh, speech to serious forms of cyber violence. Uh, so there's a a lot of gradation uh, on, on hate speech. And I would actually suggest that we would talk about hate speech as an umbrella uh, concept or a family resemblances concept. But here are some uh, working definitions for, for hate speech. Uh, in our research, we have used the concept of hate speech uh, referring to 
demeaning, threatening or stigmatizing expressions that are often based on intolerance and hatred and that are targeted at a certain person or group of people based on their gender, sexual orientation, ethnic background or race, so-called race. Hate speech is a gendered phenomenon. It is mostly produced by men and received by women. Hate speech has become more frequent with digitalization and the growing popularity of social media. It also coincides, as I said, with the rise of right-wing populism. Hate speech often utilizes the affective rhetoric and binary logic of populism, which constructs an us and them as hierarchic and, and adversarial groups. And in uh, radical right uh, populist rhetoric, the others become the targets of hate speech, against whom even violence is justified. And I'm now going to give an example. So in Finland, um, there has been research on, on uh, the contents and targets of hate speech in public discourse. Uh, and those include racist hate speech and xenophobia, online misogyny, Islamophobia, homophobia, and political hatred. Also, hatred towards, for example, politicians, journalists, and public speakers has been studied. Uh, there is this interesting case study, uh, this report uh, by NATO Strategic Communication Center of Excellence that is titled Abuse of Power, Coordinated Online Harassment of Finnish Government Ministers. And this uh, report uh, showed that there was a huge opposition against the female uh, ministers of our current government, which is a coalition in which all five party leaders are women. And it's led by Prime Minister Sanna Marin uh, of the Social Democratic Party. Online resistance to the government uh, was and still is expressed in the form of abusive messages that included uh, assumptions about their political inexperience and that really used explicitly sexist and misogynous language. Uh, I will now uh, talk a bit more about our uh, research findings. So there certainly is a strengthening tendency to silence uh, those with different ideological positions in politics. In our research, the impact of hate speech on public decision making published 2019, we found that the experience of hate speech is really widespread. A third of municipal decision makers have been targeted by hate speech because of their work, and even half of those uh, working in the Finnish parliament had experience, experienced hate speech because of their work. So this epitomizes how hate speech can be used deliberately as a means uh, of political pressuring to silence individual people or a certain political view. And what also worried, worries us uh, as researchers is that the mere threat of hate speech diminishes political participation. So even people who have not experienced hate speech themselves uh, think twice before they uh, uh, become, before they enter politics. And hate speech is unfortunately very, very effective. It reduces the political participation of its victims. <clears throat> when we look at who are the targets of hate speech, we see that women and marginalized groups, uh, people of color, LGBTQI+, uh, and young people, uh, are overrepresented. We see clear gender differences in experiencing or facing hate speech. For example, the respondents themselves in our research, uh, out of those respondents, 28% uh, of men and 42% of women had been targeted. Women also received the majority of abusive language and derogatory speech, as well as threats, um, and they experienced more hostility. And this is still about the, the 2019 research, the, the table there. So historically, uh, hate speech has emerged mostly in re relation to minorities and socially di di discriminated groups. 
hate speech has played a role in maintaining the hierarchies imposed upon these groups. But today, hate speech is a central part of political discourse. It is used as a political tool to exert pressure and influence or silence the opponent. More and more hate speech is targeted against politicians. But moreover, uh, politicians also use hate speech themselves. And when politicians use hate speech or even commit hate crimes, and we have seen that in Finland as well, it becomes especially harmful because politicians oc occupy an influential position and status. They have wide distribution networks. Their persona uh, gives credibility to their message. So, so in this case, uh, hate speech has multiplicative effort, uh, effects. So in recent years, it has become apparent that it is not only politicians, though, but also other public actors that are targets of hate speech and harassment, online harassment. Especially public officials, administrators, police, reporters, researchers, maybe also teachers, are regularly being targeted for hate speech. And this is a cause uh, for concern, because online hate has really, really negative effect uh, on the victims or targets emotions, um, both physical and psychological well-being and everyday activities. It reduces motivation, it frustrates, there's a waiver of voluntary positions of trust, and the negative effects of the family and other relationships may be unbearable even. Who then are the producers of hate speech? Uh, we investigated this in another research project funded by the government's research activities as a collaboration between University of Jyväskylä, Tampere University, and Police University College. And uh, I will go to the results that we got there because I see that there's not so much time left. So very briefly, uh, we did some uh, network analysis based on computer-assisted classification. And if you are interested in these results, you can read this uh, research online. You will find it easily there. And um, that one. And very briefly, uh, the discussion forum Suomi 24 uh, and Twitter other platforms where slurs are most prominent. And it was also interesting to see that the, the relevance of specifically Finnish platforms seems to be diminishing uh, as the international so social media giants gain more and more popularity. Of course, we don't know what's happening to Twitter now, but, but let's see. So um, our comparative uh, examination of, uh, of different actors that produce hate speech was based on internet ethnography and it was conducted on various Finnish websites. And uh, based on this ethnographic, uh, ethnographic work, we found that there are, uh, well, sort of different kinds of hate speech on various platforms, but uh, it is often very gendered. And we found these three groups, uh, the ideologically motivated, the emotionally motivated, and the performatively motivated hate, hate speech producers. Uh, the ideologically motivated producers uh, use hate speech uh, as a form of political activism. This is a small group, but it's very uh, powerful. And its prime motive is to strengthen one's own ideological position and silence uh, and weaken the opposition. And these actors are organized to accelerate online discourses to produce polarization. So political uh, hate speech is really used as a political tool and a strategy. Uh, the, the emotionally motivated producers of hate speech are the most common group, and these are sort of the, the casual users of internet. And they have, for example, uh, message board accounts, anonymous Twitter accounts, and so on. Uh, and they are really uh, easily manipulated by these ideologically uh, motivated producers. And the third group, the performatively motivated hate speech uh, producers, uh, 
have this intent to provoke uh, others or empower oneself. So these motives are related to trolling, for example. So individuals can produce hate speech without clear uh, ideology, but they may also uh, be organized and use hate speech strategically. Yeah, so I'm about to uh, wrap up now. So hate speech is an increasingly significant part of digitalized everyday life which is connected to polarized uh, political and societal discussion. It affects everyone whether we want it uh, or not. It is a multifaceted and complex phenomenon. There are different actors, it is directed at different audiences, it manifests in different environments and platforms. Uh, and I have actually suggested that we could talk about hate speech as uh, a new form of violence as digital violence that is an integral part of the chain of violence that links intimate violence, violent societal structures, and ideological and political violence. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll just go to the last slide then. Uh, so hate speech online has negative consequences for both individuals and the whole society. It affects public discussion and communication in general. It threatens political participation and the work of pre professionals, for example, in the fields of law, security, and education. I hope to have demonstrated how hate speech threatens participants and aims at restricting social inclusion. It decreases a sense of equality, humanity, and a sense of community, and declines public morals. Uh, it threatens the trust that is needed to maintaining democracy. So hate speech must be taken seriously as a harmful cultural practice that affects political discussion, decreases solidarity, and erodes democracy. Online platforms are active guardians of rights and public values, but also hosts for hate speech. They are actively forming our social and online realities. We need them to take responsibility here. Yet the solution uh, for re resisting hate speech are not only connected to increased uh, moderation of social media, but we also need to increase dialogue and decrease polarization. And we need to think how to avoid getting provoked and uh, how to analyze messages critically and to recognize mis- and disinformation. And this is, of course, where media literacy is coming handy. Uh, to end my, uh, end my talk on a more positive note, I just wanted to say what actually has been said here before, that you are not alone, we are not alone. The vast majority of citizens see that hate speech and mis- and disinformation are threats and uh, want to tackle them. And I, I believe that as, strong, as long as we take online hate and misinformation seriously, uh, we will find ways uh, to resist them together. Thank you. Thank you. Please, can you stay yeah, on the stage for a while? Because uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, before we let you go, okay. uh, thank you for bringing up the newest in achievements in, in science. Very nice to have you. Uh, first of all, which are the best ways to protect oneself against hate speech? What have you done yourself? Um, I think that the best way is to share how you feel and, and even share, the, as, as I did, I shared with you some of the, the slurs that I've been called uh, because then you can see that you are not alone in that situation either, because very many women feminists uh, get this really similar kind of response or, or kind of, so we, then we know that it's not me in person, but it's me uh, as a woman speaking publicly about these things that people wa do, don't want me to talk about, so it's not personal and then it gets easier to. 
bear, sort of. And easier to laugh to them. Yes, laughing is a very good method. <laughs> yes. Yes, of course. Given the election this spring in Finland, what are the most important actions to take right now? What can we do to fight hate speech against public decision makers in order to protect democracy? I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think that what has been done lately is that uh, hate speech has been taken seriously and the kind of leaders, the political actors have really stated that it's not acceptable. Mm. So that is a kind of very, we need to have this kind of uh, value uh, laden uh, comments uh, from the, the uh, leaders of our country that they don't accept this. I think that's, uh, and also like all the like organizations need to be there for, for the, the victims or the targets of hate speech, so they don't feel that they are alone. Mm. That's so true. Do you have any advices uh, for the audience how to fight misinformation and hate speech? I think uh, what has been challenging for me is that do not get provoked. Yeah. That's one thing. Uh, be analytic, read carefully, and don't share before you think, and all that, that kind of... So basically the things that we do when we study uh, media literacies, yeah. It's very, very important. Thank you so much, Mrs. Tuja Saresma, for uh, the very important message you bring to this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.